This is the oh, 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 oh. overarching. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's Oh yeah, these are the...
Gente, ele deu um The tone of the is that yeah, first thing. Okay, enjoy the car.
I'm here. Don't worry about it. <laughs>
Yeah, we've had yeah. So I think we can talk to
Oh, oh, sorry. I thought I was back. I think he was done. Is he, is he ready to be on the first panel? Yes. Bring a chair up to the table, okay. right? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, they're, they're going to do it right now. I think they're in the process of doing that. Well, I'm close to that. It's John. Let me, um, before we get started, what we want to do is just, we're going to make one panel. So uh, if staff would uh, bring up uh, additional chairs and name tags, you know, uh, thank you. We're going to make it work. Got enough space there, Gene? Yeah. And we can share mics and we can move them along. Yeah, it's no problem.
Okay. No. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee will come to order. The first thing I'd like to do this morning is to welcome our new members on both sides of the aisle, of course, and Mr. Issa, the new ranking member as well. Today's hearing will kick off what I expect will be an exciting and interesting two years for this committee as we carry out our oversight responsibilities. Uh, this committee has a long history of conducting vigorous oversight and investigations, and we intend to renew the continue in that tradition in the 100th level of Congress. As we continue to work together to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. Just a few days ago, Congress voted to approve billions of dollars in economic stimulus funding much of which will be spent through government contracting, it will be a massive job to ensure that this money is spent effectively and wisely, and that federal dollars do not go to the incompetent and the unproductive, the con artists and the frauds. One of the ways the federal government prevents this from occurring is the suspension and debarment process to prohibit people and companies with a poor record of integrity and business ethics from receiving federal funds. After the government has determined that a party is not a responsible business partner and is therefore ineligible for government contracts, they are placed in a database called the Excluded Party List System, EPLS. Government contracting officers are required to check the database to verify that a potential contractor is not on the list they, before they enter into a contract with the company. Unfortunately, the federal government attempts to prevent ineligible parties from receiving government contracts have not always been successful. Following an, an extensive investigation, the Government Accountability Office, GAO, found that businesses and individuals that have been excluded for the most serious offenses ranging from national security violations to tax fraud have improperly received federal contracts and other funds. The results are truly shocking. The Army continued to do business with the company even after it knew the company's president had been convicted of attempting to smuggle nuclear weapons equipment to North Korea. The Navy continued to do business with a company whose owner had fled the country to avoid prosecution for tax fraud. And the Navy gave new contracts to a company that had been suspended for replacing inspected fittings with low quality parts on an aircraft carrier risking lethal burns to the crew. This begs the question, what is the point of having suspension and debarment regulations if our own agencies disregard them. I could go on and on and on, but let me stop here. There appear to be numerous instances where federal contracting agencies have failed to check the EPLS before entering into a contract, failed to enter exclusion information on a timely manner, and failed to terminate an existing contract with an excluded company. Part of the problem seems to be that no single agency actively monitors the content and function of the database. Moreover, the EPLS database is not integrated with the main GSA contractor schedule. 
making it impossible for a contracting officer to check a single database to verify the eligibility of a prospective contractor. I think we can do better than that. We must do better than that. As I take over this committee, it is not enough for us to just identify the problems with the system. We need to fix them. I'm not against contracting. I'm not against contractors. I'm against weak management and poor contractor performance. The flaws in the system are just as frustrating for responsible companies that do high quality work as they are for Congress and taxpayers. I would like to thank the witnesses today who are here and of course I look forward to hearing your testimony but more important I look forward to working with you to get a more effective system that really eliminates waste, fraud and abuse. At this time I yield to the ranking member of the committee. Thank you Mr. Chairman and I want to thank you uh, on behalf of all of us on the dais for uh, finding a way to facilitate the optimum way to address this hearing today. As you and I have discussed uh, leading up to today's hearings, this is a new era for this committee. In the previous Congress, and one might say for many Congresses going back uh, a decade, this committee has sometimes held high profile hearings in which gotcha politics occurred. I take the blame for the Republican side. I know the chairman feels that a new era uh, implies that his side may have at times had the same problem. Those days are behind us. Chairman Towns and I came to an agreement that the, the rules of the committee will change, the practices of the committee will change, because ultimately for government to change on, on this day as we must work together. Our enemy is not the contractor, it is not the federal workforce. Our enemy is in fact not even the Senate in this case, but in fact a long history of politics getting in the way of consistent oversight and returning to issues until they're properly resolved. Outgoing Chairman Waxman left us with a list of 13,000 unresolved issues by the Bush administration. Chairman Towns and I agreed that we're going to stay on top of that list until it has been exhausted by the new administration. But whether it's the 98,000 suggestions and, and findings in the last uh, eight years of the previous administration or the ones that will come, it's not enough simply to have an administration make a finding that they've done it, they haven't done it, they're working on it. We have to look at some systemic issues. Today, looking at this exclusion list I think is a good start. It's not the finish. This is not a summit. This is in fact talking about an ongoing process in which we want to improve the accuracy of the list of who should be contracting and by definition who should not be. In viewing this list, and I think we'll put just a pie chart up here, uh, what we discovered is it is large, but it is not that large. A hundred plus thousand records, even though some of them are lengthy, in this day and age of uh, technology is not large. What we did discover is there's very little linking between uh, this database of 100,000 plus excluded parties and the ongoing entry process that our 1101 and 1102 uh, procurement personnel use every day. That is, in fact, inexcusable. We need to facilitate the ease and speed with which somebody preparing a contract, large or small, can know that they have ticked off by contractor, by person, uh, a check to see whether or not a red flag comes up. However, no amount of uh, good software and good interface between databases makes up for a skilled workforce doing their job with diligence. Ultimately, we on the dais will be talking today and asking you about specific instances in which someone was known or should have been known to have serious doubt as to whether they should be allowed or their companies should be allowed to participate in government contracting on an ongoing basis. We're going to hear from, in, in, in a unique way, all of the parties, the accusers, and in fact, those who, who have to live with these findings, make changes, work together to improve our procurement system. I'm also uh, pleased to have, uh, as the minority, added Mr. Levy, 
who will talk about, from a contractor representative standpoint, if you've made a mistake, how do you move beyond that mistake? How do you proactively admit to the mistake, make the changes, and the like? I think this is a good balance. I thank the chairman for his cooperation in starting off a new era in a new way. Uh, if, uh, if this committee is to be successful, this hearing and all of our hearings and all of our staff on both sides will have to present a united front. I believe today all of you will see we are presenting a united front. This committee is going after waste, fraud, and abuse. We're also going after systemic problems that have long lingered in which each Congress is faced with a finding that DOD can't seem to get it right. DOD can't uh, get this. Or we need more funds in order to accomplish something that we needed more funds in the past to accomplish. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to put some anecdotal uh, examples of uh, downloads from this database for the Army with uh, 675 active listings on their exclusion list, the Navy with 284, GSA with 266, and a, uh, an excerpt from the uh, annual workforce report of 2007, which cites a 20-year uh, history of uh, 1101, 1102, and other members of the procurement workforce. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at this time, I look forward to uh, a good bipartisan effort to reform uh, our procurement process and yield back. Well, we, in order to move things along, what we'd like to do is that um, we will have one person on this side do five minutes and then one person on this side to do five minutes. So um, uh, we will just move on this side for five minutes. If anyone would like to, we can split it up, you know. Yes. Uh, gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. I want to thank you for calling this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I'm thankful that the uh, Government Accountability office investigation has led to concrete steps that our government can take to ensure that criminal contractors or contractors who engage in serious violations of their contracts are not able to receive additional federal contracts. And I regret that the U.S. government continues to expend precious tax dollars on companies that lack integrity and should be but are not currently on the list of excluded parties. Uh, as we get into this oversight, I just want to call one thing to your attention. Uh, it's a specific question uh, about the standards uh, for disbarment. Uh, and, and listen to this case, Mr. Chairman. The Kuwait and, and Gulf Link Transport Company, K uh, KGL, uh, is a Kuwaiti company that provides contract transportation services to our military in Iraq. They're required by contracts with the Department of Defense to maintain liability insurance coverage. As far as I can tell, they've never provided the Department of Defense with evidence that complied with this requirement. Here's why this is significant. On May 19, 2003, an employee of KGL negligently jackknifed a tractor trailer, causing a collision with a Humvee of one of our service members, Lieutenant Colonel Dominic Rocco Barragona, and it cost Lieutenant Colonel Barragona his life. He was a uh, 82 graduate of the United States Military Academy, served our country for 21 years. The Barragona fa family has been trying unsuccessfully for years to get KGL to accept responsibility for the death. The family's attorney made three separate efforts to serve KGL with process. Company refused. <laughs> family's attorney sent a representative to Kuwait to meet with KGL officials. Here was their response, Mr. Chairman. We're a Kuwaiti company. We're untouchable. This is what they say to a family of a dead GI. Now, if these rules for debarment can't protect our military, then who can they protect? I'm going to be interested to hear what this panel has to say, because if these hearings mean ever anything, they ought to be able to at least protect one person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, yield back. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake. Gentleman from Arizona. Hi, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this hearing being called, and, and uh, this is a, a matter of should be of great uh, uh, concern to all of us. We are going to be spending a boatload of money here uh, with the stimulus, with the uh, the omnibus that we just passed, and 
um, we need to make sure that it's spent wisely. I, I think a lot of us are concerned that there simply aren't enough qualified contractors out there to carry on this work. Um, a lot of us feel that uh, there's simply too much government money being pushed out at any one time, so it's extremely important uh, that we have good oversight here, and that's why this, this committee um, is, is going to be important moving forward on this front. And, and so I, I commend the chairman for holding the hearing. I look forward to the testimony and, and also uh, um, learning how what your feeling is. Also, it, it, are there enough qualified contractors out there? I'm glad that we're looking to make sure that, that those who have uh, committed fraud and, and whatever in the past are not going to be eligible and aren't going to be uh, getting these contracts. Uh, but I am concerned that uh, pushing this much money out there this fast is going to be very difficult uh, without um, um, lowering our standards considerably as to who gets these contracts. So I look forward to the hearing and thank the chairman for calling it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gentleman from uh, Ohio yield back two minutes. So if someone else on that side would like to. Yes, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just thank you for calling this hearing. And also, I welcome your comments and those of the ranking member. I, I, it's amazing to me that we could be wasting and allowing so much money to go to waste without the kind of follow-up and follow-through that is necessary to prevent it. And um, I'm glad that, that, that you have opened our hearing process this year. And I look forward to getting to the depths of what's taking place with procurement, what's going on, why it is happening. And again, I thank you for calling this hearing and look forward to working with this committee for the next two years. And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chavis, Chavis will do the rest in two minutes. Mr. Chavis has two minutes, right. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the chairman for calling this. This is, uh, this is of vital importance as we start to talk about spending literally trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, of particular concern, and one of the things I would appreciate the, that you address at some point, uh, was our president's call to end no-bid contracts. Uh, we just saw the Congress yesterday pass uh, 9,000 earmarks in one of the most egregious and overspending bills I, I could, I've ever seen. And I've only been here a few days, so uh, as a freshman. Um, that, that, that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait till you've been here a while, Jason. No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, for some of you, this is a, 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 not a critical of issue, but how are we going to deal with the, uh, the call from the president to end no-bid contracts? Uh, how are we going to deal with this with a lack of competition, perhaps in some space? Um, and balance that out with the needs to get the job done uh, in areas that we need to get done. Um, but I please know how much the American people are counting on you to address their issues and spend their money wisely, and uh, I appreciate hearing from you and participating in the panel today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We will turn now to our, our first panel. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in, so if you would all stand. Raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If so, answer in. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Let the record show that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Today we have appearing before us is uh, Mr. Gregory Cutes. Cutes is Managing Director of Forensic Audits and Special Investigations, FSI, in the Government Accountability Office. The mission of FSI is to provide Congress with high quality forensic audits and investigation of fraud, waste and abuse, and evaluations of security, vulnerabilities, and other requested investigative services. Mr. Coots and his team have accomplished this mission today by providing our committee with the report before us, and we want to welcome you as well. We also have with us today Mr. James Williams, is the Commissioner of Federal Acquisition Services within the General Services Administration. 
uh, which includes management and oversight of the agency's federal supply schedule. Previously, Mr. Williams was the designated acting administrator of GSA from August the 30th, 2008 until January the 20th, 2009. Welcome. Mr. David Drapkin is the Deputy Chief Acquisition Officer and Senior Procurement Executive within the Office of the, of the Chief Acquisition Officer of GSA. In this capacity, Mr. Drapkin oversees the agency's excluded parties list system, known as EPLS. Amongst other programs, welcome, of course, uh, Mr. Ed Harrington, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Procurement. On December the 8th, 2008, uh, Mr. Harrington is a retired senior United States Army officer. Having achieved the rank of Brigadier General, Mr. Harrington has 28 plus years of experience in weapons and information systems life cycle acquisition, contracting management, and military logistics operation. Welcome. Mr. Michael Jaggard. Jaggard is Chief of Staff and policy within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy's Acquisition Management. Prior to his retire, prior to retirement from the Navy in October of 2001, Mr. Jagged held the rank of captain and had served 30 plus years to our nation's welcome. Mr. Frederick Levy is a partner with McKenna Long and Aldridge. Mr. Levy has represented and advised numerous corporations concerning government contract negotiations, award performance, and contract termination. Mr. Levy's specialty is the resolution of complex com com compliance and ethic issues. That's really good. Welcome. Your entire statement is in the record of all of you, and so let me just say up to you uh, that you all have five minutes, and then, of course, which will allow the members an opportunity to um, uh, raise questions with you. So why don't we start with you, uh, Mr. Cutes, and uh, start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss. It is on. Put a little closer to you. Thank you. Gotcha. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the excluded parties list system. Today's testimony highlights the results of our investigation into whether excluded parties were improperly paid. My testimony today has two parts. First, I will discuss the problems that we identified, and second, I will discuss the key causes of these problems. First, our testimony highlights 25 cases of individuals and businesses that received millions of dollars improperly after being suspended or debarred. As shown by the slides on the monitors, our 25 cases include companies whose owners illegally shipped parts to North Korea for its nuclear weapons program, substituted inferior parts on an aircraft carrier, illegally dumped chemicals into city sewers, made fraudulent purchases using stolen government credit cards, and falsified records for required SEC filings. Additional activity for these 25 cases includes mail fraud, wire fraud, tax fraud, false statements, money laundering, bribes, kickbacks, and bid rigging. The individuals and businesses responsible for these acts were supposed to be prohibited from continuing to receive government contracts and other payments. However, in these and likely many other cases, the system failed. Let me briefly discuss two of these cases for you. First, in July of 2005, the Army debarred a German company and its owner for attempting to smuggle 22 tons of ultra-strong aluminum pipes to North Korea. These pipes could have been used to make weapons-grade uranium sufficient for several bombs in a year. The monitor shows excerpts from the Army's debarment memorandum, which states, and I quote, the United States has a compelling interest to discontinue any business with this morally bankrupt individual, as continuing to do so would be 
irresponsible, end of quote. Unfortunately, one Army command paid this company over $4 million for work ordered after this debarment. In total, the Army paid this company $20 million after the owner was convicted of violating German law. You might be thinking that this command was unaware of this debarment, or as they say, didn't get the memo. You would be wrong. According to the Army, this command was aware of this debarment, but contrary to the memo you see on the monitors, chose to continue doing business with this company. Second, in April of 2006, the Navy suspended a company for product substitution. Specifically, a company employee intentionally substituted non-conforming fasteners for steam pipes on an aircraft carrier. According to the Navy, these fraudulent acts endangered the lives of 3,117 Navy sailors aboard the USS John F. Kennedy. Despite this suspension, within a month, the Navy made three awards to this company for over $100,000. I'm sure that by now you're wondering why the federal government continued doing business with these fraudsters and criminals, which leads to the second part of my statement, the key causes of these problems. Overall, we found a broken system and in several cases, acts of deception by company owners. Examples of the breakdowns include missing data and errors in the system, inadequate system search functions, agencies not entering exclusions into the system in a timely manner, and contracting officers not properly checking the system. Although GSA and many agencies are involved, nobody appears to be responsible for making sure that exclusions are properly enforced. As I mentioned, we also found acts of deception by several owners. For example, one owner simply set up a new company with a slightly different name and a new identifying number. In another case, the owner's wife operated the company during the debarment period using her maiden name. Given the lack of effective oversight, just about any scheme could be used to beat this system. And finally, you're probably wondering why we've set this dragon skid body armor at the table. Let me explain. We bought this body armor on the federal supply schedule from a debarred government contractor. This company was debarred by the Air Force for falsely labeling 590 of these vests as having been tested when in fact they were not. However, rather than removing the company from the supply schedule, GSA listed it as an approved vendor with no warning that the company was debarred. In conclusion, I believe that the 25 cases I have described for you here today are in fact the tip of the iceberg. Further investigation would reveal dozens and perhaps hundreds of similar cases. The last time I was before you, Mr. Chairman, I testified that thousands of government contractors with billions of dollars of unpaid federal taxes continued to receive billions of dollars of new government contracts. Unfortunately, today's story is just as bad, or maybe it's even worse. Stories like this cause taxpayers to lose faith in their government. How can we explain to taxpayers that millions of their hard-earned dollars are being paid to known fraudsters and criminals, including those that have violated our national security interests? Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you and the ranking member for shining a spotlight on this important issue today. I look forward to continuing to work with this committee on matters related to fraud, waste, and abuse. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Coots. Um, at this time, we hear from you, uh, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Chairman Towns, ranking member Issa, and members of the committee. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to, to discuss the U.S. General Service Administration's Excluded Parties List System, or EPLS. With me today is Mr. David Drabkin, the Acting Chief Acquisition Officer for GSA, who will detail specific actions GSA has taken to address issues raised by the GAO report regarding the EPLS. The EPLS is a valuable tool that helps protect the government's interests. Given the vast number of contract actions that take place each year in which the EPLS is used in accordance 
with the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the system works today. However, we take all isolated incidents seriously regarding EPLS, and we have made and will continue to make improvements to ensure the system works to continue to protect the government's interests. In this regard, we appreciate the work of the GAO in looking at the system and identifying the incidents set out in the report and their causes. On December 12, 2008, GSA received the GAO draft report setting out GAO's findings with regard to EPLS. The draft report identified a range of deficiencies in the maintenance, use, and operation of the EPLS. I am pleased to report that Acting Administrator Prouty signed GSA's response to the GAO draft report and agreed with the findings and recommendations of the report. In fact, GSA has already implemented many of the report's recommendations, and GSA will use the report's findings to enhance the use of the EPLS. As part of our agency role of providing the government's centralized acquisition delivery systems, the Office of Management and Budget designated GSA as the lead agency to manage the Integrated Acquisition Environment, or IAE. The IAE is an e-government initiative to help streamline, streamline and improve the federal acquisition process. The IAE is composed of 10 acquisition systems that facilitate every phase of the acquisition life cycle, from market research to contract administration. Through the IAE, acquisition functions common to all agencies are now managed centrally as shared systems. The EPLS is one of the 10 IAE systems. It is an electronic web-based system that identifies parties excluded from receiving federal contracts and certain types of federal assistance and benefits. The EPLS keeps the federal acquisition community aware of agency suspensions and debarments across the entire government. While EPLS users are currently able to search, view, and download both current and archived exclusions, we intend to make the EPLS easier for them to use and with more reliable results. GSA's Federal Acquisition Service understands how important our role is in the interagency contracting system. To that end, we regularly refine our systems and guidance to agencies when we become aware of issues, such as GAO's findings in its report regarding our multiple award schedules program. As a result, the Federal Acquisition Service has taken the following actions. Number one, adding reminders to our customer-facing e-tools to ensure our prospective customers are aware of potential excluded parties prior to placing schedules orders. Number two, establishing placing messages within our e-tools to remind purchasers to check the EPLS prior to placing a task order. And number three, providing direct access links to the EPLS website within our systems GSA Advantage, eBuy, and eLibrary to allow for easy access to suspension and debarment information. Moreover, the Federal Acquisition Service is currently evaluating all of our training and will ensure that our guidance directs the review of EPLS data at all appropriate times in the acquisition process. The guidance will also describe the steps necessary for removal of excluded entities from the schedules program where appropriate. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member ISA, and members of the committee, GSA looks forward to working with this committee, the GAO, and our federal agency customers to make the EPLS a more user-friendly and reliable web-based tool so that it remains a valuable acquisition tool. We thank the GAO and this committee for helping promote awareness of the EPLS system and its continued value as a tool that protects the government's interests. That concludes my statement. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Williams. Um, this time, Mr. Drapkin, hear from you. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member ISA, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to share with the committee information concerning the excluded parties list system commonly referred to as EPLS, the rules governing suspension and debarment in the federal government, GSA's administration of its suspension and debarment program, and its leadership as managing partner for the integrated acquisition environment commonly referred to as IAE, of which the EPLS is a part. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member ISA, in addition to serving as GSA's Acquisition Chief Acquisition Officer, 
and a member of the FAR Council, I have held numerous positions within the federal government and have served on a detail to the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, all focused on government acquisition. As is more fully described in my prepared statement, I have devoted much of my professional life to procurement policy, including serving as the head of a contracting activity, a trainer, as an agency debarment official. I have also advised contracting officers as a member of the Judge Advocate General's Corps, then as a civilian attorney with the Army's Judge Advocate General's Corps, a civilian attorney of the Office of General Counsel in the Defense Logistics Agency, and I was one of the Army's first fraud counsels and ran numerous fraud counsel programs within the Department of Defense. Nobody is more committed to seeking out and re 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 reducing fraud in federal contracting. I was also part of the DOD organization when we worked with this committee in 1994 to write and pass the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, commonly referred to as FASA. And then I led the implementation of FASA in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And all of that has bearing on some of the issues that are raised in this report on suspension and debarment. Suspension and debarment are not tools for imposing punishment on contractors or individuals who have violated federal procurement rules, or for that matter, any other rule or norm that reflects on the company or the individual's present responsibility. Punishment is left to those departments and agencies who oversee or regulate various aspects of commerce or who are responsible for the enforcement of the nation's laws. Suspension and debarment are prophylactic measures designed to protect the government from doing business with companies or individuals who are not presently responsible. Presently responsible is measured by many factors which are all set forth in FAR Part 9. We have developed tools over time to disseminate information about those companies or individuals who have been suspended or debarred. Those tools have evolved from written publications to online interactive tools. We continue to evolve those tools, making them more accurate and useful to government contracting personnel in ensuring that the government does not do business with companies or individuals who have been suspended or debarred. As Jim mentioned, we are pleased to say that EPLS and the suspension and debarment processes are working. And while the GAO report does identify several instances where mistakes were made, we do not believe the report demonstrates that any of these mistakes were the result of deliberate attempts by federal contracting personnel to circumvent the rules or systemic failures in EPLS. EPLS, the system itself, sir, is not broken. Still, it gives those of us who devote our lives to purchasing on behalf of the, this great government no pleasure to learn that we make even one mistake. As GAO is aware, we have training for our contracting officers on the requirements to check EPLS before awarding a contract. We have changed the EPLS so that now we require the use of the DUNS number, a unique identifier, to identify companies or individuals who are suspended or debarred. And we have added the DUNS number uh, to all but 150 of our over 56,117 active records, and we're trying to address the 150 records, which don't include DUNS numbers now. When we suspend or debar a company, we tell that company what the consequences of suspension and debarment are in the letter suspending or debarring the company, and had the GAO a representative shown you the full letter, it would have told them that they are not eligible for awards of contracts, tasks, or delivered orders in the base on the body of that letter. We require contractors to certify prior to submitting offers that they are not suspended or debarred. We conduct reviews of our contracting offices to make sure that they are following our guidance. And when we find that they are not, we determine the reason and we correct it. And if you've just heard from Jim, Federal, GSA's Federal Acquisition Service will add features to help make sure that our scheduled customers know that a contractor has been suspended or debarred. Last year, our contracting officers across the federal government awarded over 11 million contracting actions. The year before, almost the same number. There were a little more than 28,700 of those individuals in the government last year, and they awarded $456 billion worth of contracts. In 1991, we had over 33,000 contracting specialists who awarded over $190 billion. 
Last year we did three times as much work with one-sixth less people. It may not, it's not an excuse for making mistakes, but it may well explain why on occasion mistakes are made. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, the EPLS is not broken. Our rules are clear. Our contracting colleagues are trained. We review our work and we are committed to improving our process and we do so regularly. I am prepared to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Japkin. Um, General Harrington. Chairman Towns, Congressman Issa, distinguished members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the excluded parties list system and the report on it by the Government Accountability Office. I have a written statement that I respectfully request that be made a part of the record for today's hearing. Without objection. I appreciate the efforts of Congress and this committee to address this effective use of EPLS, and I thank the Government Accountability Office for alerting the U.S. Army to this very important issue. Mr. Chairman, the Excluded Parties List System, or EPLS, is an essential tool for our contracting teams. As a result of the GAO's findings, I released a policy alert to contracting officers Army-wide to re-emphasize the requirement for contracting officers to use EPLS. I reviewed the actions covered by the GAO report, and it is clear that mistakes were made. Contracting officers awarded contracts or orders to suspended or debarred firms because EPLS was not checked. Upon learning of these errors, the Army took immediate action to retrain these contracting officers and implement changes in local procedures. I am pleased to report to you today that Department of the Army level procurement management reviews this fiscal year show a significant improvement over previous years in evaluating and awarding contracts to responsible firms. Mr. Chairman, I'm also pleased to report that the Army is taking lasting and significant actions to improve contracting in expeditionary operations as well as our institutional contracting functions. We are working to enable a contracting mission that is agile and responsive to our warfighters while ensuring proper fiscal stewardship of taxpayer dollars. A critical important issue for us is the size, structure, and training of the military and civilian acquisition workforce. From 1998 to 2006, the contracting workforce declined by 20 percent. While the workload and the number of dollars associated with that workload experienced a five-fold increase. The Army, with the help of Congress and the Secretary of Defense, is making steady, forward progress in addressing these workload, workforce issues. As a result, the Army has added more than 850 contracting professionals over the last two years. This holistic focus on Army contracting will ensure that we attract and retain additional military and civilian contracting professionals who are trained to meet the increasingly complex demands placed on them. Mr. Chairman, Army contracting makes up 65 percent of total Army expenditures. As stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, the Army is doing a better job of managing and documenting contractor performance. And I agree that greater emphasis is, right, is rightfully placed on their management and oversight. We appreciate the efforts of this committee to address the effectiveness of the excluded parties list system. This concludes my opening remarks, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Harrington. Captain Jagger. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Issa, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of the Navy's use, regulations, guidance, and training concerning the government's excluded parties list system. The Navy and Marine Corps are absolutely committed to conducting our business dealings only with responsible, ethical business partners. The Federal Acquisition Regulation requires that purchases and contracts be awarded only to responsible prospective contractors, and it prohibits making a purchase or awarding a contract unless the contracting officer makes an affirmative determination of responsibility. One of the explicit elements of this responsibility determination is having a satisfactory record of integrity and business ethics. The FAR goes on to say that contracting officers should use the EPLS in making the determin this determination of responsibility. As a general rule, the FAR does allow the continuation of contracts or subcontracts in existence at the time the contractor was debarred, suspended, or proposed for debarment, unless the agency head directs otherwise. 
However, unless the agency head makes a written determination of compelling reasons for doing so, the FAR explicitly prohibits placing orders or exceeding guaranteed minimum under indefinite quantity contracts or placing orders under the federal supply schedule contracts or basic ordering agreements or adding new work, exercising options, or otherwise extending the duration of current contracts or orders with listed contractors. In May of last year, in response to GAO's preliminary findings that some contracting officers may have been making awards without ver first verifying whether or not the prospective contractor was on the EPLS, our Department of the Navy Acquisition Integrity Office investigated and found out that in some cases what the GAO found was true. The circumstances varied, but in a few cases, the EPLS search function required an exact match, so unless the firm's precise name was entered in its entirety, a negative report would result. We understand this has since been corrected. Immediately upon learning of these errors, the AIO, in conjunction with my office, issued a fraud alert titled Required EPLS Verification Prior to Contract Award. And this fraud alert was distributed to all of the department's contracting officers last year. Additionally, in order to ensure contracting personnel stay aware and vigilant on this important matter, we followed up the fraud alert by disseminating a training package on EPLS to all of our Navy and Marine Corps contracting officers. The briefing contains a concise but thorough articulation of the regulatory requirements regarding EPLS, and it is an invaluable reference tool for our contracting officers today. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Issa, the GAO clearly identified a few transactions that slipped through the cracks. However, rest assured that the Department of the Navy does not condone any violation as being acceptable. Through our fraud alert issued last May, our targeted training initiatives, and improvements to the EPLS software, we believe the weaknesses that allowed these actions to occur have been effectively addressed. I thank you for the opportunity to work with this issue with this committee, and I welcome your questions, sir. Thank you very much, Captain Jagger. Mr. Levy. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, <clears throat> members of the committee, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today on this very important topic. My name is Fred Levy. <clears throat> I'm a partner with the law firm of McKenna Long and Aldridge, where I've practiced federal procurement law for more than 30 years, specializing in ethics and compliance issues, and particularly uh, in the area of suspension and debarment. Uh, while I'm here today to testify on my own behalf, uh, I note that for the past three years, I've also served as co-chair of the American Bar Association uh, Public Contract Law Section's Debarment and Suspension Committee. Uh, and in that capacity, I've worked closely with a number of agency suspension and debarment officials and Department of Justice representatives to review, analyze, and comment upon legislative and regulatory developments related to suspension and debarment. Uh, debarment and suspension from federal contracts is an important tool uh, that enables the government to ensure that its contractors are presently responsible. And by that I mean that they have in place the requisite corporate culture as well as the processes, procedures, and, cr and controls that are required to perform contracts in an ethical and compliant manner. A contractor that is debarred or suspended by any agency is ineligible to receive not only new contracts, but any new work, including new orders, uh, throughout the executive branch unless an agency head determines in writing that there are compelling circumstances to make such an award. That is the only exception. Uh, debarment and suspension also applies to subcontracts in excess of $30,000. The grounds for debarment or suspension are specified in the Federal Acquisition Regulation known as the FAR, 
Uh, they are broad and provide agencies, suspension, and debarment officials with wide latitude. Uh, the grounds include conviction or civil judgment for commission of a fraud in connection with obtaining or performing a contract, including misrepresentation of eligibility for award, uh, commission of offenses involving theft, falsification of documents, bribery or false statements, and, quote, any other cause of so serious or compelling a nature that it affects the present responsibility of the contractor or subcontractor. Uh, it is important to remember, as Mr. Drapkin said, uh, that debarment and suspension are not punitive measures. Uh, the government has criminal and civil remedies by which it can recover damages and punish offenders. Uh, their purpose is to assure present responsibility uh, and compliant contracts performance going forward. For that reason, the FAR requires that even if grounds for debarment exist, that is not the end of the inquiry. The suspension debarment official must also consider ten must also consider ten other factors to assess whether the government is protected from similar wrongdoing in the future. Those factors include, for example, the disciplinary measures taken by the contractor, the corrective and remedial measures implemented, implementation of revised controls and ethics programs, cooperation with the government's investigations, and whether the government has paid all liability and made restitution. <clears throat> the suspension debarment officials' discretion in deciding whether to debar, to debar provides the government with substantial leverage, and it allows the suspension debarment official to play a role in shaping a company's ethics and compliance culture. As a condition for continuing to do business, the suspension debarment official can require the contractor to enter into an administrative compliance agreement that influences the contractor's disciplinary actions, requires the contractor to implement specific training processes, procedures, and controls, and may also impose, report, report, may impose reporting requirements and outside oversight. Such an agreement has significant benefits for the government. It prevents innocent employees from losing their jobs because a company has to shut down or cut its workforce due to reduced work. It ma maintains competition, reducing no-bid contracting, and it maintains the industrial base. <clears throat> the EPLS is the tool used by the government to sure, ensure that its acquisition personnel and other government contractors know who is ineligible. It's publicly available. I have it earmarked as one of my favorites. The FAR requires contracting officers to check it twice, to check it after receiving bids or, officers or offers, and then again to check it before award. Today, it's easy to use. It's like performing a Google search, and it does allow use of common search tools like and or or. I also note that the FAR places responsibility on contractors as well to identify whether they are suspended or debarred. All contracts in excess of $100,000 require the contractor to certify whether it or its principles are suspended, debarred, or proposed for debarment. If, as GAO uh, points out, there are situations where a listed contractor received an award and the proper procedure for making that exception was not followed, uh, that is not appropriate, but it's also not due to lack of law or regulation. But rather, in my experience, it would appear to be principally due to human error, either in the listing process or because someone failed to check the list. Uh, in my view, that stems from a lack of training and an inexperienced and understaffed federal acquisition workforce. And if a contractor intentionally misrepresented their eligibility, there are numerous laws and regulations to address uh, that situation. <clears throat> I do believe, however, that there are ways to improve the suspension and debarment system. Uh, the ABA Committee on Suspension and Debarment, which I co-chair, undertook a study last year and identified a series of recommendations. Uh, they include strengthening the role of the interagency, the government's interagency suspension and debarment committee, combining the different rules governing suspension of and debarment of contractors 
and suspension and debarment from non-procurement transactions such as grants into one common set of rules. Formalizing the ability of suspension and debarment officials to enter into administrative compliance agreements that's now done on an ad hoc basis and making those agreements public. Providing for a lead agency when multiple agencies have an interest in a contractor and making a determination of responsibility just like a determination of non-responsibility binding. I would be glad to share a complete set of our recommendations with the committee and to work with the committee. Uh, with that, I will conclude my remarks and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Levy. Um, at this time, um, we will open, I'll start with questions and of course I will start. Um, You know, um, I think it was uh, Mr. Chanick mentioned the uh, stimulus package, and um, it made me really think about it. And I want to ask you, Mr. Coots, I want to know, are there guarantees to ensure right now that none of the economic stimulus will go to excluded corporations? Just two weeks ago, we passed a $787 billion stimulus package, like, like a week ago, really. And a lot of people and a lot of companies want a piece of that action. In your opinion, are the loopholes in the system so big that they need immediate attention to make sure that stimulus funds aren't going to convicts or to con artists, that they're going to where they're supposed to go? I believe on the contract side there still is a risk that this would happen, but probably the bigger vulnerability if GSA is moving forward with some of the proactive things Mr. Drab can decide is on the health care side. Uh, we are aware Medicaid providers in the system right now that are suspended or debarred. So, for example, uh, some of the stimulus money is going to Medicaid. Uh, it would appear pretty clear that they're going to get some of this money. And I expect you also have other vulnerabilities here we haven't talked about today. You have the whole subcontracting community. We didn't look at subcontracts. Subcontracts are another risk. But hopefully some of the efforts that GSA has taken over the last several years will, will pay fruit and there will be less vulnerability to this happening. But I think the bigger risk is on the part we haven't looked at yet. Right. And this question I'd like to ask all of you except Mr. Levy. Um, time and time again, GAO report highlights that taxpayer dollars have fallen in the hands of companies and business owners that should not have ever received even one contract with the federal government, let alone several. For instance, it goes without saying that federal agencies should not contract with individuals convicted, convicted of attempting to um, smuggle nuclear reactor parts into Korea, North Korea. Yet the GAO exposed that the Department of the Army did exactly that. Further, federal agencies should not contract with companies convicted of massive tax fraud or falsifying filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Nonetheless, the GAO discovered that agencies were actively contracting with such irresponsible and untrustworthy businesses. What I can't seem to understand is why is this occurring? Why are agencies awarding contracts to those crooks when the Federal Acquisition Regulation specifically states that contracts must be awarded only to responsible, prospective contractors, and it even prohibits awarding a contract to a company unless the contracting officer makes an affirmative determination of responsibility. Let's just run right down the line right quickly. I, the only thing I could answer, say in answer to your question, sir, is the system's not perfect and people make mistakes. And in, in a couple of few instances where the contracting officer failed to check the EPLS because they mistakenly believed that issuing a modification to a contract didn't require doing so. We've taken corrective action to train people better on how to use, properly use the system and not make those mistakes. General? Sir, a similar situation uh, exists in the Army. We, we made some mistakes. We had some misses. Uh, not uh, intentional errors of omission, but just uh, missing uh, having to perform that check. Uh, in other instances, we found, uh, as Mr. Jagger suggested also, modifications, delivery orders, task orders, 
uh, elements of a contract that were in the process of the contract when they were issued were not uh, there was not a check of EPLS made. Uh, we since strengthened the notice to the field that that process has to be performed uh, even when issuing a modification or a task order or a delivery order. Mr. Drapkin. First of all, Mr. Chairman, let me assure you, as I said in my statement, both written and oral, that we do not want these mistakes to happen. Secondly, as Mr. Kutz noted and as Jim said, we are taking steps to systemically to address the issues. Third, however, I just want to make sure that we're all clear. GAO found 25 instances. We then went back and did a search over the last three years. That would be about 30 million transactions. And we found 35 instances, including the 25 reported by GAO, where six companies who were suspended or debarred got awards. In addition, there's some confusion that not explained fully in the GAO report. For example, a number of their cases involved awards made under the micro-purchase threshold. The committee may recall that when it passed FASA, when this committee drafted the language for FASA, we made some decisions about micro-purchases. And one of those decisions were that because of their value and the cost of the transaction to make those kinds of purchases, we wouldn't require a host of the contracting requirements that we would require for purchases over $3,000. So when a, when, when a administrative assistance takes a purchase card and goes to a local vendor to buy $50 worth of paper, pencils, or pens, they're not required to check the EPLS. And at least three of the examples in the GAO report involved micro-purchases. So I guess, and, and then the last thing I would say to you is our office working with OMB and with my colleagues on the FAR Council at DOD and NASA are currently drafting the guidance to address how we're going to implement the ARRA, the stimulus package. And in our guidance, we will again remind individuals to check the EPLS list before they make award. But, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, the mistakes happen in this system. They're unfortunate. When we find them, we correct them. We are committed not to make mistakes, but we do a lot of work and we don't have a lot of people to do that work with. Right. Th thank you very much. You know, but remember, we're talking about waste, fraud, and abuse here. I want you to know that. Yes, uh, Mr. Williams. Mr. Chairman, like everybody else in the room, I believe we are the greatest country in the history of the world and that our government is based upon a system of trust. And like the gentleman to my left, I've spent my professional life trying to earn that trust of the American people and spending taxpayer money wisely and effectively. However, uh, in, in these incidences, there are places where people have made mistakes. Also, some of these are incidents where people have actively tried to cheat the government. And we take every one of these incidents seriously as something that chips away at that trust that we try to earn uh, from the American people. And when we learn about these things and the causes, as GAO has pointed them out, we take steps to plug those loopholes, to provide better training, to enhance the systems, to make sure that we can eliminate these. It may never be foolproof because there will be people who may make mistakes and people who will try and cheat the system. It is our job and our passion to make sure we do everything we can to eliminate those mistakes and those people who try to cheat us. Right. Mr. Mr. Coos, you heard the announcement, and I, and I brought him down the line so you'd be able to hear what was being said. Uh, now, I would like to get your response. Do you believe, uh, like Mr. Drapkin stated, that the instances are just few and far in between and, and that they're so remote and, and, and that we really shouldn't even discuss it? Can I agree and disagree? I'd like to agree and disagree at the same time. I would agree, first of all, that if you add up the money and the dollars, it's not something that's going to be material. But I think the bigger point here is the safety and security issue and protection of the government. We're talking about, let's use the North Korea case. One exception, but very important. You're dealing with someone that's sold out to the North Korean government with respect to their nuclear weapons program. The Army debarment memo said that that one instance put it lives to jeopardy of 37,000 troops in South Korea. Look at this body armor here. This company sold 590 of these to the United States Air Force, mislabeled, subsequently found to not pass the tests. So materially-wise, dollar-wise, yes. But 590 lives could have been jeopardized by the use of this. Another example, the 
uh, expired adhesives used on aircraft engines. Again, is it, are we talking about big dollars? No, but people, U.S. soldiers and, and military people flying these aircraft are at risk of having substituted parts. And so I think we're talking more about the issues such as the safety of our men and women in uniform than dollars here. So that would be my position, Mr. Chairman. We're just serious. Yes, on that note, I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think I'll, I'll kind of pick up where you left off. I do want to make one question, ask one question on a, to set a tone, though. Mr. Levy, what would you say would be the risk if we were to have absolute zero contracting to any company immediately? In other words, if we take this step and, and we don't just pick up the 30, but we sort of make sure we catch them all, including the micro and so on, what would be the and briefly, what would be the potential risk of, if you will, overuse of, of exclusion? Is there a risk there? Well, uh, uh, I, I, believe, I believe that there is a risk. Uh, I, I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are lots of indi individuals who, for their own personal reasons or because of lack of training, uh, make mistakes. There are people that do it uh, intentionally. There are people that do it inadvertently, uh, but th there are lots of companies that out, uh, out there that in encounter problems. Uh, if the government were immediately to debar and suspend uh, any such company, uh, I think that you would put a lot of uh, innocent workers on the street. Uh, oftentimes, these uh, events that are discussed, uh, that have been discussed here, are the working of a few individuals within a large corporation. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, people in those companies who are well-intentioned, who are well-intentioned, who intend to comply with the laws and the re regulations. Uh, and those are the people who would suffer uh, when the company loses its, uh, uh, its work. In addition, obviously, uh, the federal government would lose uh, its supply base. Uh, and it would lose its competition. And at this particular time, when we're so worried about no-bid contracts and competition, uh, it would seem to me that that would be a very unfortunate circumstance. So, Mr. Levy and, and Mr. Kuntz, I think you both would be a good sparring here. Because there is, and this was not in your report as a wrongdoing, but there are, in fact, people who are suspended or companies for one activity are suspended Well. Uh, a theater commander or some other purchasing authority makes a written finding that they should continue on some other contract. Well, that is that is remedied, uh, et cetera. In other words, a partial suspension. Would you would you both agree that that's essential that we not tell you today to do absolute, but in fact to deal with some of the examples we have here today, while recognizing that there are valid reasons for the waivers? And I, Mr. Coons, I, I particularly want to know from you because. That is one of our concerns is there's a procedure in place, assuming these 30 or so exceptions are set aside for a moment because we don't want to tolerate those, that the, po the basic policy, the basic ability for a, 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 a purchasing authority to certify and thus continue purchasing for some reason is in fact a tool in place. You're not suggesting we change that, are you? No, not necessarily. I think there's a lot of facts and circumstances involved. For example, if the company's been doing business with the government for many decades, has a fine history of performance, and it is an isolated case or a lower-level employee, that's one thing. If it's like this German case, where it was the actual person that signed the contract, owned the company, etc., there were three years involved in that one where the Army had a chance to get out of it, basically. The guy was arrested two weeks after the contract was let. Nothing was done for three years, and that was an egregious case. So I think there's judgment involved, and it's a facts and circumstances. Well, I, I might note for the record that the, uh, uh, the gentleman who was convicted of being part of the bribing scheme of Duke Cunningham was a government contractor, and some of his contracts went on for a period of time, fortunately a short period of time. Uh, let me follow up along this line in a couple of areas. First of all, uh, can you tell us when this committee will receive the final report? We only have a draft report up until now. It's just being released today. Today is the okay. day it's being released. Okay, so, so today is our day. Today is the uh, day. Secondly, I want to get into the databases for a moment. These are Oracle databases. All of your procurement is on Oracle databases. This, this is a database that is in Oracle format, the EPLS, right? And it's apparently apparently less than 100 uh, gig of data. So small enough that people can go to Best Buy and buy a, uh, a USB drive, download the entire database, 
and carry it around. Isn't that correct? I'm, I'm, obviously, you're not carrying around an Oracle license, but we did some downloading and discovered that this 100,000 or so records is, in fact, something that you could overnight uh, update into other databases. Is that your understanding, Mr. Coons? I, I couldn't answer that question. Well, let me, let me ask everybody else here. Have any of you in your procurement looked at the idea of synchronizing this database and then integrating it so that it's a part of your, your basic everyday, every contract overnight is updating against that database and running it so that this, these 30 examples couldn't happen again? Is there anybody who's done it uh, from the panel here? I saw a few heads shaking. The answer, Mr. Issa, is no. And the reason is because we do not have a consistent set of transactional tools across the federal government. My colleagues in the Defense Department can talk to you about the numbers of transactional tools they have. In GSA, we have three or four separate transactional tools, and not every agency has a set of transactional tools. So what you're asking, the linking of the transactional tool to the database so that it knows before it gets ready to award a contract that an individual company's DUNS number appears in the database, it, it can't happen if you don't have a system. Okay, so I'm hearing about a self-inflicted wound. Uh, in, Mr. Kuntz, in, in the GAO report, will you be speaking to the need to correct those self-inflicted wounds of databases that, in, in, a, in a sense, were designed not not to take advantage of this database which existed at the time of their latest revisions. Well, an example of integration of database, I believe, would be the, the excluded part or the uh, federal supply schedule because one of the questions and one of the recommendations we had was that companies that are debarred should potentially be taken off of the GSA supply schedule. Apparently, data system issues and integration issues within GSA are a reason why that may be difficult. So that is an important aspect of the Okay, and, and, and I don't want to take any more time than, than, uh, than, than this last question. Last question simply is, when I reviewed the database, what I discovered, because it's a public database, there are no social security numbers for individuals. So an individual's unique identity is only as good as a common name and a home address at some point of time. Can you, in fact, commit to us today that that, that will be corrected at least in a not for the public database so that we can have unique identities like a DUNS number for human beings? Because it's very clear that companies don't commit crimes. People in companies do. Uh, is that something that's in your report? And can I get a commitment from people here that that, that is on your priority? Well, I would just say 60,000 60, of the 70,000 active records are individuals, as you said, and individuals are the ones that commit the crimes, and they do not all have social security numbers, and they're not required fields at this point. Thank you. I yield back and thank the Chairman I for thank the gentleman. If I, I may, thank, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I'm going to go on to my questioning yes, so sir. you can take that up uh, later. Uh, Mr. Coates, uh, in your research and study, do you uh, come across information that was raised that was probative but not acted upon to start procedures of suspension or debarment? We didn't come we didn't weren't given any idea. You didn't look at no. you didn't look into any of that. Well if we saw it we would have had it, but we didn't see anything Excuse like me? that. Excuse me? We didn't necessarily see that in all the cases, no. So it's possible that there could be many more instances out there that haven't been acted upon. Well, we know there's other cases. I mentioned, for example, Medicaid providers. This, this, the scope of this job was contractors. So we're talking about companies. As Mr. Isis said, there's more people in the system that are individuals that committed crimes, for example, health care fraud. There are potentially many Medicaid providers out there at the state I, level. Well, when you put that bulletproof uh, or apparently bulletproof vest in front slightly of the bullet slightly bullet-resistant vest, thank you, uh, that that really sends a chilling message out to everyone who serves this country. Because your responsibility here, the members who are representing the armed services, is to protect the lives of our soldiers and those who serve. That's a very serious responsibility. And it's not enough to say, well, it just happens a couple times that somebody slips through the system. No, you have to have zero defects. Otherwise, you're directly responsible for the deaths of our soldiers. Now, the, the thing that uh, I, I want to say to uh, General Harrington, I read your statement saying that our Army will remain ever vigilant to meet the needs of our war fighters with the urgency demanded by life and death situations they face every day as they superbly execute the global war on terror. Our war fighters' success is directly linked to the success of our contracting workforce. I, I think you're absolutely right when you say that. But I'm trying to square that with a record of a specific case. 
And that is a case that I mentioned in my opening remarks on May 13, 2003, an employee of KGL Transport Company negligently jackknifed a tractor trailer causing a collision with a Humvee of Lieutenant Colonel Dominant Rocco Barragana that took the Colonel's life. Here's somebody who served the country for 21 years, a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy. Do you know anything about that case, General? Yes, sir, I do. Um, what do you know about it? The, the recent information I have is that Procurement Fraud Division uh, served notice of suspension on KGL for failure to comply with the service of process. And uh, what happens as a result of that? Later, sir, KGL complied with that service of process rules, so the suspension was stopped. What does that mean, they complied? Um, as I understand it, sir, they responded to the service of process. I don't have any further information. Are, are you familiar with a, with a uh, comment from KGL's representative saying he's a, they're a Kuwaiti company and they're untouchable? I'm not familiar with are that, Are they sir. untouchable? Um, are they untouchable? Well, sir, I, I know what we've done with our procurement fraud division. If you're responsible for the death of a U.S. serviceman, is that grounds for debarment? And if not, why not? Well, sir, I can tell you what's going on since then, and we'll take a question for record to get back with you with the full details. I'm, I'm just asking you generally speaking. Let's step away from this case for a moment. Yes, sir. A U.S. contractor, if a U.S. contractor is responsible for uh, the death of a U.S. service person and they were found to be negligible, would that be grounds for debarment? And if not, why not? Well, sir, the, there would have to be an investigation of that incident to determine. Have you investigated this incident involving yes, Lieutenant Colonel Barragona? Yes, sir. Procurement Fraud Division is carefully. Do you think there was negligence? Well, sir, I can tell you what the Procurement Fraud Division found. What did they find out? They carefully reviewed the matter, concluded that there is not sufficient evidence to support suspension at this time. I would like you to produce. Yes, sir. Uh, for this committee with, of course, with the permission of the chair, uh, Mr. Towns, all records relating to this finding. How in the world a lieutenant colonel serving his country, just doing his job, driving a Humvee, can end up getting killed by a U.S. contractor and there not be negligence, I think the people of the United States and everyone serving this country would be interested. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to review this. I'm also going to ask uh, Mr. Kutz, for you to look at this case as well. My uh, time uh, is about to expire, but I can assure you, General Harrington, yes, sir. that on behalf of this one serviceman and his family, that this case isn't going to go away and that KGL is not going to be able to avoid any responsibility they may have under law. And so I just am asking Mr. Kutz for you to look at it. I've just been uh, informed that uh, we are going to recess for, um, hold on a minute, we, we, we can do this right now. We can take a few, another round of questions. Yes. So uh, uh, we could take a few more questions, uh, at least on, on each side. Uh, Chair recognize the gentleman from California for uh, five minutes, and then after that, uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Davis. We'll take a 40-minute uh, a recess, and then we'll come back uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, being a Seen back in the uh, late 70s, we were both mayors together uh, when we were young and spry. I think that any mayor will know, though, that uh, this um, situation with the death of uh, military personnel, there is this issue of, like we did when police officer fire, we may have a wrongful death. And you draw, is it an individual action separate from the institution and separate from procedures, or is there a procedural and an obligation by the institution itself? And that's the kind of questions you want want to address with the gentleman program. yield yes uh, the information that was presented to to myself and to my staff was that in this specific case the company the company refused to uh, to answer any questions and had taken a, a pretty arrogant position with respect yeah. to this so that's why I brought it up and I, I thank you for your observation and, it, and we ran into that all the time when in the good old days um, let me just say uh, mr. Williams I had sort of a you were saying the system we trust was based on trust. And the last time I checked, though, in this country, um, you know, I looked at our money, and in God we trust, everybody else has to verify. Um, 
I, th I think that um, I'd like to go sort of, um, you wanted to address the issue about social security numbers and, um, and personnel, not, uh, you know, the, the contractor's names. You any reference to that quick now? That I, I saw your eyes kind of flash when that thing, so I want to give you a chance to jump on that. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to point out to the committee that we have, in fact, discussed the issue of using social security numbers as a unique identifier for people who are suspended or debarred. But after consultation with a variety of agencies and departments, including the Department of Justice, it was determined that we could not use the social security number as the public identifier, the unique identifier for people who we suspend or debarred. That does create a problem for individuals who are debarred because not every individual gets a DUNS number, which is usually done in the context of a is commercial Is it because trade. you're preempted by the social security legislation right now that says it can only be used for social security purposes? I don't believe the current legislation was current at the time we had this discussion, sir. Okay. Is there any reason why we don't use E-Verify on all our contractors to make sure they are who they are and so that you're not coming back? Sir, E-Verify, as you probably know, was promulgated as a rule. That rule has been suspended under the Emanuel Memo and is being reviewed by the new Secretary of uh, Homeland Security. And I, I don't know what the status will be. Uh, of the rule after that review. With a system that's 98.6 percent efficient, it seems like the one way to know people are who they are is E-Verify is probably the fastest and most simple way of doing it. Sir, I'm unable to address whether E-Verify works or doesn't work or whether it will be our policy or not be our policy until the Secretary of Homeland Security has completed a review in accordance with the manual memo. Okay. Um, going back to um, is there a process right now that a contractor has to notify when they put in a bid or when their procurement that they have been disbarred or they have been suspended in any time? Is there any obligation for them to notify? Yes, sir. They are required to certify and to maintain that certification as current in our system that's called, the acronym is ORCA. It's an online system and there is an absolute requirement for them to certify before uh, when they submit a proposal and then to update that propo uh, certification if it changes at any time. When is it, what is the penalty for not following that procedure? Uh, there are no penalties, sir. We don't apply penalties in the contracting process, but a false certification could result in a determination that the contract was void ab initio. It could result in the termination for default of the contract. It could result in the suspension debarment of the contractor. The Justice Department could decide whether they wanted to proceed against the contractor for a false certification, either civilly or criminally. Could is you know, open to interpretation. In other words, you say you could do this, could do that, and could do that. It seems to me there should be some minimum that says if you do this and it's found you've done this, you at least get this. You may get this, this, and this, this. What is the, what I'm worried about is it doesn't seem to be a minimum that could happen from a direct violation of procedure. And any parent will tell you there should be some minimum um, repercussion for not playing by the rules. But, sir, as you pointed out when you were the mayor of the, uh, of the city before becoming a member, you take each case on its facts, you find out what happened, and then you apply the appropriate response to those particular facts. There is no guaranteed result. Uh, for any of these um, infractions. It all depends on the facts. We have a process that seeks out the facts, that conducts a hearing. We do have due process that's due to the contractor before we can Gen take any of these actions. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, recognize Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kutz, I'd like to focus in on what, in my opinion, is the most disturbing case GAO uncovered in its report. Specifically, I'm referring to the case involving the Army's contract with a company called Optronic GmbH. As I understand it, Optronic, or at the very least, its president was convicted of, of attempting to smuggle nuclear bomb parts into North Korea. Even though the Army was aware of the conviction, it kept doing business with Optronic. Well, that's obviously troubling to me and I suspect to what would be troubling to a lot of people. 
But the question that I have, and I'd like to know from you, given the seriousness of this matter, is whether or not the Army fully cooperated with GAO during the investigation. I would say no. They were very slow to get us the information. I, could, I have some of the notes here from my staff. We requested information on this case and a number of other cases in April of 2008. The first, it asked for data in several weeks. The first data we got was in July, and it was incomplete. It was really the debarment memorandum. We didn't get the actual uh, memo that justified that they said they legally had done these transactions with this company until October, and we didn't actually get the contract and relevant emails until November of 2008. And that was after committee staff finally had to call. So, no, I would say that they were slow, not on just one case, but on about five cases. It is also, then, my understanding that uh, committee staff here has had some difficulty getting information from the Army. And so I'd like to ask you, Mr. Harrington, why did the Army stall on providing the GAO and committee staff with the information that they requested? Was there some something that the Army did not want us to know? Of? Yes, sir. There's absolutely no intent on the part of the Army to stall. Uh, we understood we provided the information as rapidly as we could. Uh, an awful lot of that information had to be researched and gathered uh, from uh, several different locations. If there are specifics on that, uh, please, I'd like to know, and we'll go back and correct it. But uh, uh, we, we've done everything we could to faithfully provide the information that was asked for. Can I, can I give you a specific? Yes. There's a memo dated May 8, 2008. We got that memo in October. Is that specific? I think that's pretty specific, and if, would you consider that to be timely in any kind of way? It's one page, by the way. Sir, I'd just like to, I would just say we'll look at the circumstances surrounding why it took that long. Well, let me just ask you, Mr. Kutz, uh, does GAO believe that the Army had an escape clause where they didn't have to keep doing business with this company? Yes, we do. And in fact, we have a picture on the monitor, if you could just take a quick look at that, that shows the timeline, which gives you a broad perspective of this. This contract was awarded and signed by the individual that was ultimately convicted in March of 2003. Two weeks later, he was arrested, and the Army then extended his performance contract. It was a three-year contract. They did the first extension then in March of 2004. He was then convicted in May of 2004, and almost a year after that conviction, they extended the contract for another year. Finally, the guy was debarred and the company debarred in July of 2005. So there were several cases where they had outs, and I want to read to you information from the contract, actually, about one of those outs. It was the contractors performing services in the federal – this is out of the contract. Contractors performing services in the Federal Republic of Germany shall comply with German law. Compliance with this clause in German law is a material contract requirement. Non-compliance by the contractor or subcontractor at any tier shall be grounds for issuing a negative past performance and terminating this contract. That's out of the contract. Let me just ask quickly, Mr. Harrington, could you tell us why the Army felt that it was obligated to continue doing business? So the contract was, was with Optronics, not Mr. Triple. Mr. Triple was arrested, convicted, and sentenced. He was removed as managing director in 17 June of 2004. We feel his reach into the company was stopped at that point because he was jailed. Uh, with regard to the uh, comment about compliance with German law, that uh, if you read further into that clause, it's about making sure that they comply with German law with respect to work permits identification requirements and employee qualifications. The gentleman's time has expired. I, Let me I, just ask Mr. Levy if I could. Uh, Mr. Da quickly. Mr. Davis, uh, we have two minutes to get to the vote. If you want, I'll let you do a follow-up question when we come uh, back, right. and then we go to Mr. Minutes. Tierney. The chairs, uh, we are going to recess for 30 minutes. I would ask all the witnesses, uh, please return in about a half hour. We're in recess.
Well, so what we ended up doing is we ended up combining the first two panels. <laughs> so, um, we have to figure out what we want to do with you. And, I mean, I guess maybe when we come back, we can have you do you know, your statement and then go into more questions. Okay. That we've, that we've seen. Some of the information in there, so the big thing is just look at recommendations because they fit on almost every thing I've been checking off that people have been talking about. Them. Right. So it's awesome. Awesome. somebody needs to ask the question. I was being honored that I was going to be by myself for the second time. Well, I don't see why I'm not honored. There were a thousand people here.
Yes, I'm going to
You are currently You're entitled to use the time.
I understand we've been joined by Mr. Amy, and of course, who did not hear us when we uh, combined the panel. So will you stand now and let me swear you in, and then we can have your statement. You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. So at this time, um, um, Mr. Amy is the general counsel of the Project on Government Oversight, better known as POGO. Mr. Amy currently directs POGO's contract oversight investigations, including review of federal spending of goods and services. The responsibility of the top federal contractors and conflicts of interest and ethics concerns that have led to questionable federal contract awards. So we welcome you, and at this time we will have you to make your opening statement, and then uh, we will have questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and I apologize for not hearing the merger of the panel uh, discussion. Good morning, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isa, and members of the committee. Um, the bio you just provided, I won't provide on because I know I have, or you know, add to because I know I have limited time. But I thank you for allowing me to testify today. Suspension and debarment has been a process that's been on Pogo's radar for nearly 10 years. In fact, we released a report in 2002 entitled "The Federal Contract Federal Contractor Misconduct: Failures of the Suspension and Debarment System." POGO requested that the government review the suspension and debarment sp system, especially as it applied to large contractors with repeated histories of misconduct, including the award of contracts to entities that defrauded the government or violated laws or regulations that have had poor work performance or contractors that had their contracts terminated for, for default. That report, uh, also in 2002, led POGO to release what we call our Federal Contractor Misconduct Database, which is a database of federal contractors that have criminal, civil, and administrative uh, instances against them that also includes fines, penalties, and settlements. We have over 800 actual and pending cases in our database, and the total is over $25 billion worth of settlements, penalties, fines, or restitution paid to federal, state, local, foreign governments or private sector entities since 1995. Last year, Chairman Towns, former Chairman Waxman and Congresswoman Maloney spearheaded legislation to create a comprehensive government-run contractor performance and responsibility database. I think today's hearing is showing that there are some errors and some problems with the current suspension debarment system and that we need to consider how to consolidate a lot of this data together and make it work together, integrate it, so that contracting officers, suspension debarment officials all have the most relevant, accurate data in front of them to make contracting and suspension and debarment decisions. POGO recommends that this committee provide public access to the Federal Contractor Responsibility and Performance Database. Currently, it will not be publicly available that they increase the scope of civil and administrative cases included in that database to include cases settled with no omission of guilt or liability. We feel that that is still a indication of a company's integrity and uh, satisfactory record of business ethics that needs to be highlighted for the government as well as the public. To require that all administrative gr agreements are shared among agencies and are made publicly available. This was uh, a recommendation that came from GAO in 2005. I know the former head of OFPP, Mr. Dennett, was working on making those all public, but I'm unsure of the current status of that and whether that plan has actually taken effect. And again, it goes back to previous GAO reports that you implement all of the GAO's recommendations from today, that you also make determinations and justifications publicly available. Um, that was the first panel talked about about determinations and justifications, especially for continuing a current contract, that they mandate that an offer or bidder that falsifies a certification regarding responsibility matters is immediately considered for suspension or debarment and that those decisions are made publicly available, that you consider the use of background checks for companies' principles, especially co contractors involved with classified or sensitive information, and that you also take a look at this new pilot program for subcontractors and try to marry up how many subcontractors are out there currently working that may be on the excluded parties list or have long track records of uh, misconduct. Um, with that, I'll conclude my remarks. I thank you for inviting me to, to testify today. I look forward to working with the entire committee uh, in trying to fix the problems that have been highlighted today. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh,
sorry about the confusion. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I yield to Mr. Turney. Okay. You go ahead. You go ahead. Right. go ahead. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for his consideration on that. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for your testimony, but I have to tell you, I'm a little bit troubled on this, and maybe it's a misunderstanding, but you know, if, I, if I sit back and look at this, I think uh, general people might look at it. I, I hear everybody saying it's the system's fault. You know, we, we've got this um, electronic list system, and it, and it isn't working or whatever, but I think there's a lot of human error involved here, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that it isn't sort of a, a cultural thing, that it isn't just a casual attitude or a sloppy attitude about making entries. When you see 27 percent of the time Dunn's numbers aren't put in, uh, I wonder, you know, where's the management in all of this? And so let me, let me ask, what agency is taking responsibility for making sure that all of this is going properly, that the database is monitored and that we know uh, when things aren't going right? Sir, uh, that would be GSA. We, we are the managing partner for the integrated acquisition environment of which EPLS is a part. My program manager and the director of that program sitting right behind me. We do have the responsibility for managing the database on behalf of our other federal agency partners. We are checking the database and as I mentioned in my opening testimony, uh, I'm able to report today that only 150 of the current uh, active 51,117 records lack Dunn's numbers, and we're in the process of getting those 150 records updated. Well, you know, it's also a bit of an issue of vigilance here. I mean, it's, it's interesting to know that, that GAO went out there and found 25 incidents, and then either you or somebody else there said, oh, she went, we found 35. And that's a small number compared to all the numbers out there or whatever. But why wasn't the check done before GAO had to get involved? Why wasn't that a regular course of business? And who was responsible for it not having been a regular course of business? And what action was taken with respect to their inability or, or unwillingness to do their job? Uh, sir, it is the responsibility of every single contracting officer. That responsibility is laid out in the regulation. It is laid out in the training okay. that we I'll provide I, them. Because I got a little time, somebody is the boss of all those people, and somebody ought to have been monitoring that to make sure on a regular basis that was being done. Now, if somebody did that at the GAO put out their report, I want to know why didn't somebody do it before it got to the point the GAO did the report. Why wasn't it a regular practice that somebody did the kind of scrub the GAO did on this and made the, the corrections as you went along? So that's a good point, and I'll take it back to the FAR Council, and we'll look at what type of guidance we can issue to see if there's a way to run a check periodically. To make well, there obviously sure is. Somebody did it after the GAO did it. It's, it's, that is you true. Proved it can be done. GAO proved it could be done, and you proved it could be done. That's correct, sir. So I mean, it's just not very edifying to sit up here and somebody say, "Well, well, we read GAO's report, and gee, you know, they're right. They got us. We made some mistakes, and uh, may a culp or whatever." It goes deeper than that. This never should have happened. Even you want to try to minimize the number of incidents and say it's only 35, and she's not a lot of money. There's a lot of lives involved. When the Truman Commission was in place, there were two measures. One was how much money was saved. The other was how many lives were saved. And I think that point was made by Mr. Cutts earlier on that. So I, I expect and I hope that you will go back and then report to this committee exactly what the process is going forward for that to be done on a regular basis and what you're going to do about what might be a cultural problem out there, of either laziness or sloppiness or people not thinking there's a price to pay when they don't put the Dunn's number in on a regular basis. Uh, the only now, issue I take, sir, with your comment is obviously 35 errors out of 30 million transactions is not a cultural problem, but I take your point. But 27 percent of the time not having a Dunn's number entered in may well be a cultural problem. It took in a period of time when we were transitioning to adding the Dunn's number to the database, sir. Well, you know, whatever. 27 percent is 27 percent, and vigilance is vigilance. On yes, these, sir. And the consequences are serious on that. So yes, sir. I expect that everybody's going to do something on that. I'm still troubled by this Optronic case. So, so General Harrington, let me tell you that you know this guy, you know, the president of Optronics is arrested you know, three weeks after he gets a contract, and the Army doesn't uh, disbar him or suspend him. Uh, time goes on, he's convicted, he's sentenced, and they're still doling out money to this guy, to this company. Now, you said something about, well, gee, you know, he was in jail, so he thought he was off the street, and so he kept doing business with the company. So is the idea here that as long as you form a corporation, any agent of that corporation can uh, commit a bad act, and then the company still does uh, get contracts with the government? Is that the deal? Well, sir, the company was performing uh, more than satisfactorily in its contract obligations to the Army. It was rated excellent in its performance. 
Uh, what, tell me the excellent part about making sure that the, the Koreans got parts they weren't supposed to get. They didn't get any parts, sir. Those parts were confiscated before they ever got. All right. Well, very good point. So let's one of the pick nits. Let's go this way. What's the good contract part about having it get to the point where they had to be confiscated, and that this individual who's responsible for that, his company continues on getting money from the from the government and from the taxpayer. So the company uh, was providing civilian um, actors on the battlefield for army training for a major training event for two combat brigades entering combat into Iraq. Um, there was a deliberate decision, a set of decisions made to uh, assess whether or not that company ought to go on. Its performance was rated as excellent. They were a capable company, irrespective of the fact that the managing director had been jailed. He had also been removed Did from the company. Does anything sound bizarre to you about that? I mean, you know, maybe I'm the only one hearing this oddly or whatever. There are other companies that do this kind of work. There are other companies now doing this work, in fact. And the Army makes a decision to deal with somebody who has this kind of a background, their principal officers, and I just don't get it. What is the reason for that? I mean, there's got to be some price to pay for people stepping out of line like this, not saying, well, gee, it's a little inconvenient for us to go find somebody else, even though there are other qualified people out there who can do it. Yeah. There's likewise, sir, a process to go search for other companies to perform that type of uh, work at a uh, major training area. Uh, at that point, uh, Optronics had over 500 people engaged in the performance of this contract at the training area. Uh, an assessment was made to determine whether other companies available right then and there to continue on with this work to be able to move these brigades into Iraq. They were a part of a flow of combat brigades in and out of Iraq and a part of the buildup going in. Uh, the, the, the critical element here is that these soldiers get trained in actual realistic scenarios before they have to enter into combat well, with terrorists. The inference that you're trying to draw there is that nobody else could have done it and stepped in on there, and I think that's simply not accurate. Uh, know, that's and, and that's the case. And, and this is certainly, you're at least acknowledging that it's not something you didn't know about. It was a headline in the Washington Post in August of 2003. Mm -hmm. So you guys knew it. You consciously made the decision to not go to other qualified people to do it, but to let this country company carry on. That's exactly I think right, that's sir. short of astounding. That's right. exactly right. We made a deliberate decision to continue on. Yep. Well, the gentleman's time has expired. But let me um, uh, say that, uh, Mr. Drapkin, um, please notify, let the, can we keep the record open to hear what happened in, when you go back and you talk about the suggestion that was made you know, by uh, Congressman Turney in reference to the discussion. We will hold the record open for that. Because, you know, I view this as being, you know, uh, very serious. And I think, you know, I want you to know this hearing is about the possibility of legislation if we can't, you know, because any time you place troops in jeopardy when you sell vests you know bulletproof vests that don't put to, don't don't block bullets and when you sell things to the enemy i mean that the time I mean, you, you just can't ignore those kind of things now we want to try to see what we can do in, in, in terms of you fixing it but if you cannot fix it then this is what this committee is, is about and uh, and we want to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, but we're also about security as well. So Mr. Chaffet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Captain Jagger, you alluded in your impromptu testimony that there were instances where they didn't actually use or tap into the system. How often does that happen? And is it normal protocol to actually use or not use the system? In, in the 25 cases that are the subject of the GAO report for the Navy, there were seven of them. There were two instances where the, the list was not properly checked by the contracting officer. So is it common practice to use the system? I mean, it, 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 it's required that they use the system, and that's why we issued the fraud alert as soon as we found out to remind everybody that they're required to use the system. So in this case, the employee didn't use the system that was in place. She, she mistakenly thought that they didn't have to use the system for a modification to a contract, which was the action that was involved. Okay. And she was wrong. M Mr. Coots, um, I, help me here with the math and the understanding of, of uh, what, what you found in your perspective. My understanding is over the last seven years, there's been something like 70 million transactions. Is that right? Contract actions? Does that sound I right? I trust Mr. Drabkin's numbers in that respect. Roughly? Yeah, roughly 70 And that million. there are 70,000 either entities or individuals that are listed within the system. How many... How many different contractors does that represent? If there's some 70 million transactions or contract actions, I guess, how many different vendors does that represent? I, uh, 
I'll have to get back to you with an exact number, but it averages about 250 to 300,000 vendors, different vendors a year. And across the years, there are some vendors who remain the same, and there are some vendors who are added or deleted to the base of vendors who do business with us. And that does not take into account those vendors who sell to us through the micro purchase program, because we don't report. We only sure. recently started that reporting process. So you're telling me there's 250,000 or so different vendors, but yet we, we have 70,000 that are listed on this? That's 70,000 companies or individuals are listed. There are a lot of individuals who are listed who've never done business with us at all. For instance, uh, there are congressmen who are convicted. There are citizens who are convicted, never done business with us before, but we suspend or debar them. There are individuals from companies who are suspended or debarred, and the company may itself not be suspended or debarred. Uh, so 70,000 does not represent the number of companies, and there's no direct correlation between that number and the 250 to 300,000 vendors we do business with on a day-to-day -day basis across the government. I guess at some point I'd like to clarify, uh, or time short here, on how pervasive this problem is. Are we dealing with, you know, 2 percent, 1 percent, a fraction of a percent, 10 percent of the vendors or individuals that we're having trouble with along the way actually at some point run into trouble where they have not met the criteria and end up in this database. Um, I, I would ask you each, and if we, uh, we're times uh, so brief here, how in the world are we going to deal with literally trillions, trillions of new dollars going into the system with the resources that you have as uh, within your own departments uh, in terms of personnel and the data bank? How in the, how in the world is that going to work? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? I'd be glad to. Uh, we are concerned about that, concerned about the capability and the capacity to be able to spend that money wisely and, and effectively. And I will tell you, uh, most of the major acquisition agencies are trying to hire right now. What we're concerned about is the labor pool we're trying to hire from that we're all trying to. How long to does it take you to train somebody to, to get up to speed to actually become an acquisition officer? Well, to become a, a, a contracting officer, the warrant, what, usually about five years or so. Uh, of training and work. Five years of training? Five right. years of training. They, they start at the lowest level and they, as a contract specialist. And then once they've, get, they've received all the training and the experience and in the judgment of a senior official that they have the training, uh, the business skills, the right ethics, then they're awarded a contracting officer warrant. I, I've only got seconds here. Uh, let, let me also ask. Ten separate systems, is that correct? Is that what we're dealing with here? Or is there the integration of the system so that you all can communicate with each other? How pervasive is that problem and challenge, and what are we doing to rectify it? There, there are ten separate systems that make up IAE. There's only one system for EPLS. Okay. That system and the integration discussion I had with Mr. Uh, ISO was about integrating that database with transactional systems that actually award contracts. There are multiple transactional systems throughout the government. It's a tool that we lack. Had we that tool, the instances of mistakes would be further reduced. What, what are we doing to solve that? I know my time's up here, but I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Is there a plan to actually solve that that challenge? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Davis, I, I understand that you were shortchanged, and I'd like to correct that. Mr. Chairman, you know I don't ever want to be shortchanged, especially <laughs> being from Chicago. <laughs> but we, let me. We yield, we yield to you two minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to revisit uh, the optronics uh, situation that we were discussing when we left, and. Uh, Mr. Harrington indicated that the Army had an obligation to do business, to continue doing business with Optronics, and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. But then one reason I understand for continuing to do business with a debarred company or individual is that there is no other contractor that can provide specialized goods or services uh, Mr. Kutz, do you know what Optronics was selling or providing to the Army? Yes, it was uh, called Civilians on the Battlefield, or Role Play Actors. Uh, they were acting as mayors, refugees, villagers, uh, and the qualifications according to the contract where they need to understand English, 
for example, be willing to work 10 hours a day, be properly clothed, overshoes, extra socks, thermal undergarments, and they were not allowed to have consumed any alcohol before Role coming on Role-play and actors? Role-play actors, yes, making uh, probably 10 or $15 an hour, something along Mr. those lines. Mr. Harrington, is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Um, in your opinion, Mr. Cutts, was this a unique service that could not have been done by another company? No, I believe someone was doing it before and someone's doing it now, from what I understand. Mr. Levy, could I ask you a question? I don't know if you, if you would comment. Do you think that there was, you know, as an expert in procurement, as a practicing attorney, uh, do you think there was any escape clause or any way that the Army could have escaped or gotten out of this contract? Uh, what, got, gotten out of the contract altogether? Yes. Well, without having seen the contract, uh, I think the first thing. Or not continue to do business uh, at this juncture. Well, well, it's two different two two different questions, uh, uh, Mr. Congressman. One is, could they have gotten out of the contract? And two was, could did they need to uh, award additional work? Uh, with regard to the additional work, they they had to make. Uh, a compelling circumstances determination, and that's what's being discussed. Uh, and that would go not only to whether or not there is another source, but whether there was another source that could timely provide that particular service, or if it would have impeded the Army's mission. I don't know the answers to those questions, uh, but those would have been the questions to ask, and, and what would have been the cost of standing down this particular contractor and bringing in another company in, in, short, in a short term. So those are, I believe, the questions to ask in a compelling circumstances determination. With regard to whether they could have gotten out of the contract altogether without having seen the contract, uh, but, but typically, uh, and assuming that the uh, impropriety here did not relate to the actual performance of that award, and as I heard, uh, uh, General Harrington say uh, they were performing excellently, uh, then typically within the government contracting, uh, government contracts, there's what's called a termination for convenience clause. And that clause uh, permits the government uh, for any reason to terminate a contract of its own volition, so long as it's not done in bad faith. But there are consequences to the government of exercising that clause, uh, because the government then is liable for, to the contractor for all the costs it has incurred, not only for liquidated products and services delivered under the contract, uh, but for all the costs that are incomplete, has to pay the contractor, make them whole. Whatever they've incurred in terms of costs, they get reimbursed those costs plus a profit. They get reimbursed the costs of putting together their settlement proposal. Uh, so the, the, the Army would have had those costs plus whatever costs it would have incurred to re-procure. But, but as a technical legal matter, they probably could have gotten out of the contract. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask my last question. Uh, General Harrington, if the president of Optronics was arrested and charged with violating German law nearly three weeks after having been awarded the contract with the Army, why did the Army not suspend the contract at that time? Or why did it take uh, nearly a year before, Mr. Um, before the debarment of the company or the individual took place? Sir, the Army continued on with the contract because the contractor personnel were performing satisfactorily. Um, there's a due process with regard to uh, going through the legal processes to debar. Um, the Army recognized the offense Herr Truppel had committed. It made a deliberate decision uh, to continue to engage the company because of the criticality of the functions it was performing to help prepare American soldiers to go directly into combat in Iraq. Um, when Mr. Truppel was jailed, uh, there was a de determination made that he, his reach into the company was nil and that uh, he had been removed as managing director. Uh, and again, um, the assessment was that other companies that would have to come in to do that would have to uh, be issued solicitations, and that would be a five to six month period uh, where they would have to consider uh, awarding a contract to another offeror. So the type of contract 
issued was what's called a requirements contract. It's essentially a, an assurance by the government to the contractor that all requirements that have to be performed are guaranteed to that contractor for that period of performance. Were we to terminate for convenience, uh, we would have been held in breach of contract, and that was a proceeding that we did not want to have to handle. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just note that between the time of the the, the, the arrest and the conviction, the Army paid Optronics $11.5 million. That seems to be a lot of money to me. I thank you, gentlemen, for your answers, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And let me just sort of pick up on that. Um, uh, Mr. Coots, do you agree with uh, uh, the statement made by General Harrington? That so Some of the things we agree with. I mean, I think that they had opportunities to get out. Again, as uh, Congressman Davis said, the individual was arrested in 2003, and the debarment didn't happen for several years, but he was convicted in May of 2004. Ten months after that, they extended his performance for the third year of the contract. If there was any time they could have got out, it was right there. They could have actually gotten out of it. Plus, we believe the language in the contract that I read earlier for the record meant what it said, that a violation of German law was a condition where they could have terminated. They didn't want, they wanted to take the route that was more expeditious for purposes of the role players on the battlefield rather than deal with what the Army themselves had said was a morally bankrupt individual and that doing what the Army did was irresponsible. The Army said it was irresponsible, yet the Army still did it. Yeah. You know, let me ask you, um, um, Mr. Amy, uh, now you have a database as well. What's the difference between yours and EPLS's database? Is there any difference? Yes, sir. Uh, What's the, the difference? The, the EPLS is only a list of the suspended or debarred contractors or proposed debarred contractors. POGO's list includes uh, companies that may have sit or settled with or been involved in litigation with another private party, um, a state government, a foreign government. It also may be instances of violations of federal law and regulations that have not yet put them on the EPLS. So. Our, our database, uh, EP, you know, will incorporate EPLS into it. The actual uh, legislation uh, requires civil convictions, uh, criminal or, or criminal convictions, civil cases where there's an omission of liability or a finding of liability, and then administrative cases in which there's an omission of liability. So it also includes suspended or debarred, debarred contractors and contractors terminated for default. So it's kind of three steps or four steps past what is currently in the excluded parties list. you have any idea as to how much it costs to maintain your, your database? Well, our database currently is only the top 100 federal government contractors, and we will have a new list come out because we saw that USAspending.gov just uh, updated their FY 2007 data. But our, our list is, you know, probably have cost us maybe twenty or $30,000 to upkeep. You know, obviously the way that it's implemented based on the legislation that it will include, you know, contractors receiving a certain threshold of money. So at that point it will be a little more extensive than what we have, to say the least. But I think it's a vital investment in, and the, due to the problems that we're see, hearing today, in protecting uh, the taxpayer, protecting the government, and protecting uh, war fighters. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what lesson should GA, GSA learn from from your database and what you're doing? Well, first of all, that it's possible. We were told for many years it's not possible. You know, what is the purpose? Um, we've gotten a lot of criticism from the contractors and the contracting associations that it's not necessary. But I think today uh, shows us that it is. That we need a better system. Like somebody earlier said, the system isn't broke. I think it is. Uh, 25 instances may not be a lot, but it's also how many other contractors are out there getting federal money that are in the risky side. Um, there have been policy shifts that as Re Representative Tierney asked about, that we're going after more individuals than we are companies, and that needs to be looked at. So we need to restore contractor accountability, and all these systems integrated together would provide a wonderful tool for the government to make better contracting decisions and hold contractors accountable, and I think both those things are missing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. At You're this welcome. time, I yield to the gentlewoman from uh, Washington, D.C., Congresswoman North.
Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I must thank you for this hearing. Uh, the GAO report is stunning. Uh, I'd like, I've come to ask a question, though, concerning um, what gets contracted out after um, we've already discovered uh, issues. This question should go to Mr. B Mr. Williams and Mr. Drabkin, I believe. Uh, I, uh, on um, on the screen, you will you will see perhaps if you can uh, the basis for the question. Um, the Inspector General of GSA uh, apparently in December 2007 reviewed the suspension and debarment program, uh, and the yellowed out section reads, the office of the chief acquisition officer should make every effort in the future to avoid utilizing contractors to, to, to perform suspension and debarment work is, is, is what the, the, the subject was. Uh, I'd like uh, both of you to consider that um, advice from GSA. And I'd like to ask you, why is the responsibility of maintaining uh, EPLS contracted out to Information uh, Sciences Corporation? Um, how is contracting out the previous backlog? Well, first of all, why, let, let, let's, 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 let, let me ask you why is that, that first contract done? address that issue, all of those matters fall within my office. During uh, the 2005 time frame when uh, Ms. Emily Murphy became our Chief Acquisition Officer, um, sh there was a lack of attention paid to the suspension and debarment function. Um, when the IG brought to her attention that there was a backlog of suspension and debarment cases, and when her office had been uh, basically decimated as a result of a, a reassignment and retirement of uh, every member of the office, Ms. Murphy decided to, um, to, to help uh, some existing government employees uh, catch up the backlog of suspension and debarment cases. At no time- Rather than hire somebody to do what the government was in the process. To do. She was in the process of hiring people, madam, but she had not finished the hiring process. I will tell you that it's a, I would never have done that and our office will not do that in the future, but she was trying to eliminate the backlog. None of the contractors perform decision-making functions, but nonetheless, this is the most sensitive thing we do in GSA, and it's something that should not have involved contractors and will never involve contractors in the future. As to the management of the database, the database is managed by a government employee, has always been managed by a government employee. There is a contractor that provides support, technical support, in terms of operating the servers, refreshing the software. But there is no contractor who enters data into that database. There is no contractor who quality controls the data in that database. But there is a contractor who keeps the lights turned on, adds the software, the things that, that a government employee, our government employee, is not competent to do. I hope that answers you your question, but I want to assure you in the strongest terms, GSA, as long as I'm there, will never, ever use a contractor to support any function in our suspension and debarment office. Um, how many government employees are actually maintaining EPLS at this point? We have one program manager who is responsible for the maintenance of the program. Understand when I say maintenance, 
I mean she's responsible for making sure that the systems run. Every agency is individually responsible for entering the data into the database. And so within GSA, I have a program manager who manages the database, but then I have a suspension and debarment office, which has six individuals in it currently, and we're about to add more, who enter the data and the Justice Department has an office and the Agriculture Department and the Department of Defense has several offices. So I don't have a total number of people who actually enter data, but each department and agency is responsible for entering its own data. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what the government is paying for the government employees, I can find that out easily. As I understand it, um, GSA is charging federal agencies up with upwards of a million and a half dollars for FY 2009, and there's only one person maintaining uh, EPLS. And there is a contractor supporting the actual maintenance of the servers, the software, et cetera. And by the way, we don't charge agencies. So, uh, wait a minute. So, uh, uh, the ISC then. We, we do not charge people for this service. The ACE, which is a committee of the Chief Acquisition Officers Council, annually meets, determines what work is going to be done develops a budget and then assesses each member of the federal government uh, a share of that budget. But we do not charge people for this service. This is a path. So what are we charging people for? What, what, what's we aren't on? charging for anything, madam. We, we are collecting a portion of the budget that is determined by the committee of the Chief Acquisition Officers Council. To be used for what purpose? To be used for managing the EPLS database, which includes one federal employee and the contractor who keeps the lights on on the and system. And ISC, is, as we understand it, provides the following level of support. Uh, if this is not the case, uh, I wish you would, you would let us know. One full-time project manager, one full-time software developer, one full-time database administrator, one full-time help desk attendant, one part-time system administrator. Um, uh, there may be additional responsibilities uh, that they're not able to perform that could be subcontracted to other entities. That is our information. Uh, that and the hosting function of actually hosting the database on uh, equipment of, that they either own or lease. And what, you know, they have one full-time database administrator. What in the world is uh, he do if he can't get into the data base? He, he has no authority to enter data. He, lo he, uh, he, he looks over the database, but he is not a database. He doesn't enter any data into the database. If you're asking me, is it possible that he or anybody else in the, uh, in, in the contractor's staff could play with the data, the answer is, I think it's possible. We've not received any information. We have no, re no reason to believe that that has ever happened. Well, I'm counting 15 people. Yes, ma'am. That he dedicates to this. How many do you dedicate to it? One. One federal you see employee. see my problem there? You got one. They have 15, and yet they really don't have any major responsibility. I'm sorry, I disagree. They have a very major responsibility of keeping the database up and running. That's different than adding the data. As I mean, And you believe that, in fact, that's really all that is necessary for the government to do, is to have that, that single person dedicated to that task, as long as they have these 15 people uh, uh, contracted to do uh, most of the work. I don't make the appropriations decisions on how many people I can have in my Contracting agency. decisions are not made by the appropriators. Ma'am, they decide whether I'm going to get personnel money or contracting money. I don't make those decisions. When I get those decisions on whether I have personnel money or contracting money, I then decide what to contract for. So, so you're saying that your budget, as sent by the president, or at least the prior president, uh, uh, force you to contract out these functions because that's where the money was. I'm saying that we follow the budget guidance that we receive from both the Congress and the President 
and that this has not been an issue that we looked at as to whether to bring that information, bring that function back in-house. It may very well be that this administration asks us to look at doing that, but that is not a matter that we have considered What would it cost to bring it back in-house? I have no idea, ma'am. Uh, I'd like you to provide to the chairman what would be the cost of bringing the, those who are providing you this outside service, what would be the cost if the government itself was providing that service? We will do our best, of course, to respond to any question you ask, but you need to take into consideration that we are on a plan right now to consolidate the 10 databases that we have in IAE into a single platform, which will create greater efficiencies and we hope actually reduce the overall cost of operating IAE by about half. It's a three-year plan. And so what effect would that have on the, the, we would not difference, federal between, the difference between people contracted out and people who, in fact, have responsibility in the agency. We would not, in this plan, increase federal employees. We would decrease contractor employees by achieving So even though you're consolidating, you only need one person. Even though you're putting all of, all of this together and one person is, is doing it now for, 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 for far less, you still need only that one person who is a government employee. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The program manager, the functional director, the person who understands and makes the decisions about how the program operates and what we would buy or continue to buy are people who perform non-discretionary functions, essentially administrative functions. And what we're looking for is the efficiencies by combining our 10 databases into one over the next three-year period to actually reduce the number of contractors we need and the dollars we pay contractors for providing the 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 foundation, if you will, the the servers, the database. Uh, the, Mr. Drabson, yeah, I, 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 the gentlewoman's time has long <laughs> expired. Uh, let me, <laughs> let me. <laughs> but, 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 Mr. Chairman, could I ask only that since he said that there's going to be a consolidation, uh, that, that, and, and seemed to imply that therefore if he provides that data for the present operation, it would not be valid because they're about to consolidate, then I, I could only, I, I ask that he provide the data to the chairman uh, uh, that I asked for the consolidated operation. What would be the without, cost of bringing will, the people back into the government? Without objection, we hold the record open for that information. Thank you, sir, and right. we'll take care of yeah. it. And let me just also, while I'm talking about holding the record open for information, the Congressional Research Service um, uh, did a very extensive uh, report on termination of uh, convenience under the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And I would like to also include that in the record because um, it appears that uh, uh, you could have um, ended the contract. Uh, I mean, really, you could have. But anyway, um, uh, we'll put it in the record. And, and let me just say before I yield to the, to the ranking member, um, you know, these hearings really, you know, for trying to stop wage, waste, fraud, and abuse. And we want to work with you. We want you to work, work with us because I think you're concerned about waste, fraud, and abuse. And also want to look at maybe as a result of this present structure, it can't be done. And maybe we need to look at some legislation. I don't know. But I want you to, 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 to understand that's what we're talking about here. Mr. Chairman, let me assure you that we all would love to be able to work with your respective staffs to look at ways to improve the process, because that's what we're all interested in doing. Right. I yield to the ranking member, Congressman Th Eisen. Thank you, Chairman. And, and on that note, uh, the Chairman and I were at the White House on Monday, and uh, in a sense, these issues came up, including the whole fact that we limit headcount uh, throughout government while not necessarily limiting money. So we give you money an X amount of people, what are you going to do with the money? We're going to make up the shortage in the people. I might note, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, the gentlelady uh, from Washington, D.C. has left because, uh, as you recall, when we went before House administration, we asked for 30 more slots, no more money, just authorization if we could find people who wanted to work nearly as interns, you know, obviously within a very lean budget, if we could have those slots. And I haven't heard back that we got them yet. So. Perhaps the gentlelady will join us in, in trying to get more government employees rather than us contracting out, because I, too, enjoy uh, outsourced uh, computer services from Lockheed Martin and a number of others here in, in the House, as the gentlelady from uh, the district. The uh, 
taking a little off of that, because I don't know that we can beat that horse anymore right now, uh, uh, Mr. Drapkin, before, well, I was out. I apologize. I, I serve on another committee, so I've been going back and forth. Uh, I understand that uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Bray asked about E-Verify, and, and you were aware of a letter from uh, uh, Chief of Staff Rob Emanuel that, that said that, in fact, that's in a hiatus. Is that roughly what you said? I wasn't here. No, sir. I said pursuant to the Rahm Emanuel memo, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security had decided that she wanted a period of time to review the new rule which we had published and but yet had not yet been implemented requiring contractors to use E-Verify. And I believe Mr. Bilbray's point to me was that if we used E-Verify that it would reduce the instances of cases where contractors who were debarred or suspended got contracts. I never engaged with him on that issue okay, because so I quite frankly don't right. know. Well, it, it came to my attention and it was interesting that an unelected appointed individual writes a memo and a confirmed cabinet officer stops a program that is more than a decade old and has been quite a success. But I want to bring it back to the issue here today. E-Verify is a system in which you don't get to see the Social Security numbers, but you do put the Social Security numbers into a database that has the Social Security numbers to see if, in fact, the name and Social Security number you're putting in match the individual. If the data that are in your procurement contracts, uh, including key individuals, officers, directors, and so on, if that information, including Social Security, since we have an obligation to only hire legal people in government contracting, and I have Camp Pendleton, so trust me, we've had to push a few off the base in San Diego uh, over the years when we discovered it wasn't true. So when we use that system, that system has a unique identity. And I, I go back to my question earlier, uh, and particularly for the GAO, why wouldn't we have a database in which the web to the public didn't show the Social Security number, but in fact somebody entering that information from a database would be sure of the person. Because I go back to the confusion of the, uh, uh, the woman using her maiden name, or for that matter, the woman who I think is in jail right now, but who was part of the scandal on the tankers some years ago, the refueling tankers. A person's name or surrogate name, or surname, or married name, or uh, alias, and a home address are both very easily changeable. So isn't there a fundamental flaw in this database unless we have a unique identity number for every corporation and a unique identity number for every individual, and the system pulls them both? I'll start with the GAO since it's your study. Yes, and in particular the SSN right now is, is the problem, and so there needs to be uh, some sort of a position taken as to what are the options to move forward. I mean, if the option is we're just not going to deal with it, that wouldn't necessarily be acceptable. There's got to be several alternatives, and maybe something like you're talking about here would be a valid option, because we do SSN checks in criminal cases all the time, and we give the Social Security number, but we only get back hits, and so we're not allowed access into of the course. system, for example, on that. So we do that all the time with the Social Security Administration and agencies across the government. So I think that has merit. And, yes, and Mr. Issa, I, I don't want to leave you with, with the impression that the issue on Social Security number is dead. What I meant to convey to you earlier was there had been a government-wide <coughs> policy discussion on this matter. There had been a decision not to adopt it government-wide, although some agencies are entering Social Security numbers. Most notably right now, HHS is not. And we have not had a government-wide decision, and I look forward to the new administration when they are settled in to revisiting this matter for us, and it may solve the problem, and we'll be sure to report back to you on our progress on this matter. Okay, I've got two quick questions because the time is, is over. One is, is there anyone here that, that considers himself kind of a techie? Uh, well, then I'll be the techie here for a moment. Can any of you in this day and age not envision the ease with which a individual could enter a social security number? It could go into an encryption key that is not available to anybody except the key holders. It then creates a different number. That different number then checks against looking for the identical, not social security number, but number created by the key that in fact then tells you whether you have a match. So do any of you have a problem understanding that in this day and age you don't have to have a plain view of a Social Security number that could lead to bad conduct, and you don't have to ever have it even transmitted? 
So are we talking about Social Security numbers as though it's the old days and it's written on a piece of paper and somebody might Xerox it? Or do we all understand that that, that unique identity number for both a corporation and an individual is certainly within the grasp of the technology you already have paid for? I'm seeing heads wave yes. My closing question is just an anecdotal one, for, if the chairman will endow it uh, to me. And it's for the Navy, because I, uh, I represent Camp Pendleton and the Naval Weapons Station. So I, I had to take note when I downloaded the exclusion list that uh, GSA had 266, the Army had 675, the uh, Air Force had an almost identical number, the Navy had 284. Is that because you do so much better job in selecting your, your contractors? Because <laughs> you are a fairly large service. Uh, I was just I'm just interested to see how many were on the active list of uh, disbarred or excluded, suspended. I, if I understand your question correctly, Mr. Issa, I think the my, my answer to that question would be because the, uh, the our new acquisition integrity office is doing a much better job of keeping up with the workload that they're required to handle. Okay, and, and because I'm a former Army officer, I will ask the, Ar the general. Is, uh, is there a reason that 675 for the Army means that you simply uh, more aggressively go after these people so more are on the list? So I think it relates to the numbers of transactions that we're involved in. Our, our, it's really our workload has increased fivefold, and there's just that much more um, uh, solicitations, offers, and, and exposure to the to the. I appreciate it. Over. I just needed a little bit of uh, multi-service Mr. Issa, if, yes, if the chairman will indulge me just to fill out the, the answer, Part of this also has to do with our practice of suspension and debarment. We have an unwritten rule amongst us that the agency with the most contacts with the contractor is, whether the suspension or debarment is brought to them or not initially, is referred to them to, to determine whether they want to take jurisdiction. And so the numbers themselves may not tell the whole story. It could be that lots of contractors who do business with the Navy had more contracts with the Army, and the Army took jurisdiction, and that is why the Army numbers. I know many cases come to my office that I refer to my colleagues in the services because they're our biggest customers. They take those cases from us, which is why our numbers are lower, and they handle it because they have the most contact with those contractors. Well, I want to I see you the next time Army-Navy play because I need an honest referee. Well, Thank you. Well, sir, I wouldn't be honest. I bleed Army green. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, uh, thank you for coming and, of course, uh, all the witnesses and um, for attending today. And before we adjourn, I, I remain extremely concerned that the federal dollars provided in the recently passed economic stimulus package will fall into the hands of criminals and con artists posing as, as legitimate business owners in light of a G, the GAO's findings. Therefore, I have addressed a letter to the acting administrator, uh, of GSA, Mr. Paul Prouty, outlining the key changes that must be implemented to ensure adequate management, monitoring, and search capabilities of EPLS. Uh, Mr. Drapkin and Mr. Williams, you know, providing you uh, with the, this letter, acts as an official notice uh, to your acting administrator that the recommendation of GAO and this committee should not be taken lightly because we are seriously trying to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, and we want your help in that regard. So without objections, I enter this letter into the committee record, and without objections, the committee now stands adjourned. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. See you again, buddy. Good job. Good job, man. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, they're going to give us a letter. Give us a letter. I think she's going to tell us what to do.
Okay. Yeah, it's all good. Great to see you. Take care. Great to hear you. Man, the water is delicious. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, you're on the ball. That's great. You were listening. I know. I can you too. Well, hopefully we'll see you more often. Uh, thank you. Take care. You too.
Yes, I am.